They're all about the eyes. So, my name is Neeker, and I am the chairperson of the Q Drug. So, I would definitely like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, there's a lot of information out there that isn't necessarily accurate. There's a lot of things that are being put, especially right now with the ballot question, that isn't completely accurate to what's real in the state of Massachusetts. So, we really wanted to make sure that we were getting accurate information to parents because. You guys are the ones that really have an impact on what your kids are seeing and believing. And we want to make sure that the community is aware of what's really happening, uh, especially with the ballot question, to make sure that when you do go to vote, you have the best information. Our job isn't necessarily to push you to vote, but to make sure you have the best information. So please make sure that you're listening, and please make sure that you share that information that you get with as many people as you can, because if you each tell five people, then we've got a much broader base of people who hear the information. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming. And if you have any questions at the end, please feel free to come find me. And I'll be here. Thanks, speaker. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Steve Martin. I'm one of the family physicians at the Barry Health Center. Uh, and I'm grateful to um, be a proxy for my wife, Ruth Poti who uh, is also a physician, has been giving this talk around the state. Um, and she asked if I could, in my own homeland here, give it for her, even though she's a Peterson native. Um, I don't know if it was a Mahar Kwan thing. I don't know how that went down. But I feel like uh, we're both here to, to, to spread the word. And this doesn't represent the official position of the Barry Health Center or UMass. Uh, it represents my uh, look at things, along with Ruth and other people around the state. But as much as you drive around and see signs for two, signs for other candidates, I have yet to see a sign on four, right? Which is interesting. And it seems to me sort of stealthy-ish. <laughs> and I'll be happy to expound on that because um, you know, the actual language of this ballot is incredibly dense. And hey, oh, this is when they do like, yeah, it's very dense. I read all 25 pages of it. I'm glad to save you from doing that but also recommend that you do if you want, because it's, a lot of the ballot is what's not there as much as what is there. Um, and I uh, am also glad, please bear with me, it's a computer, I'm not as used to this one, but it's awesome. Thank you very much to Paul for lending it to me. This is what the first page, two pages of the ballot measure looks like. This was not written in some bar in some weekend, okay? This is very clearly a templated, set of legal language that the ballot proposers have that is uh, tailored for each jurisdiction, each state, and really creates a set of parameters uh, that whereby legalization of marijuana would vir virtually be without any really meaningful restriction except for public use and for drug. That's about it. If you're a community of over 10,000, you can't stop uh, a marijuana venue from opening. Uh, if you want, you have no jurisdiction over people growing things in, their, uh, uh, in your jurisdiction. Um, it's really removed the, any regulatory teeth out of um, local jurisdictions and removed any regulatory power out of the state because uh, Colorado, which has had taxing authority over its marijuana at, on the order of 10 to 30 percent, depending on whether it's retail or or, or medical, it cannot keep up with the expense it takes to regulate. This is Colorado. I mean, in terms of population proportion, smaller population, Colorado, when they passed, their uh, Department of Public Health had zero way to measure the concentration of THC in any edible. They didn't have the machine. So I don't mean to get down in the dirt and details, but you need to know from my perspective, as a parent, I've got three teenagers, really one's 12, but she's like, I think she's 30. And I used to teach middle and high school. Uh, I have so much respect for Massachusetts, the kind of, I've lived here for most of my adult life. Um, I have a lot of investment in the way we think about things in the state. And having read this regulation, this is not the way Massachusetts people would have written this legislation. Uh, this would not have passed our state house. 
And so it's intentionally going directly to the voters in what I think is really a stealth campaign. No one's going to read 25 pages of this. Uh, and the Attorney General is actually sued by the proposals because she just articulated some of the things that were actually very clear in the, in the, in the 25 pages and not so clear in the way that it's been sold. So uh, I have a little, my next little talk here. Yes, new B, the poll from late last month from BUR uh, was 50% for, 45% against. Uh, new poll, I think, is out today. Maybe 55, 45. It's, you know, it's, it's there. It's on the margin, though. It depends who shows up to vote. So it, this is not a theoretical discussion, if it's OK, about like neurons and how they come together. Like We have a vote before us that it's nice to know the science behind it, but we have to pull one lever or the other. I'll, I'll let you know what I think lever matters. These, I, you know, the nice thing about democracy is everybody makes their own choice. Um, but I'll, let, I'll show you why I think this particular ballot, in this particular language, makes zero sense for Massachusetts or any other state. Um, so what I'm not going to talk about, I think these are my favorite things. Like, what am I not going to talk about tonight? Generally, right? I'm generally not going to talk about medical use of marijuana. I've been taking care of patients here for seven years. If someone wants to get a marijuana card for me, fine. Okay, I mean, I'm not, I don't really want to parse that. At UMass, we're not allowed to give those cards myself, but I don't really have a problem with people seeking marijuana. And I, don't, I think that's a red herring and the part of it runs a bit long. I'm not gonna talk about marijuana as a gateway drug. I have lots of friends, uh, lots of friends, I have friends, right? <laughs> Who may have smoked marijuana at one time. <laughs> And they're fine. Okay, I'm not out to vilify marijuana as sort of like, you know, Lucifer's gonna come up if you smoke and you're, you're, you're gonna kill it, right? That's not, the that, science is not clear on this, so I'm, I'm not, that's not my argument. Uh, and I'm not gonna talk about the legal designation of marijuana. There's a federal, it's still federally scheduled one drug. Uh, there are a lot of jurisdictional issues about legalization. Uh, I'm not gonna focus on that because that's not what the ballot measure is about. The ballot measure is, uh, I'll show you what I think it's about. Uh, what this is about is the following. Um, adolescents, and this is the part that killed me because I was teaching middle schoolers and I myself was 21, and then I was reading developmental psychology, and I was like, oh, I myself am still an adolescent. <laughs> that is so humbling when you're supposed to be teaching. Uh, but it felt real, and it is real. Adolescence really extends into the mid-20s, um, there's some variation around that too, in terms of brain development, activity, behavior, temperaments. There's a lot of development still happening up to the mid 20s and beyond. And for us to pretend, like my son is 19, that when he turned 19, like he's a grown up now, and everything's perfect, is misleading. That's not how things work. Um, it's not, there aren't cut points like that the way people grow up. Um, what do we know from other states and their measures? So I'll talk a bit about Colorado, which is state one, and Washington state is state two in terms of legalization. And I'll talk about what history tells us. And we have lots of history from big tobacco, we have a lot of history from big alcohol, we have a lot of history from prescription opioids. You don't have to look far to figure out where the money is. And the money is very much what's driving this ballot measure to my mind. I think this ballot measure to my mind uh, is I can imagine running a different ballot measure that I, Steve Martin, would vote for about marijuana. That's why the first three things here are one you can know are true. It wouldn't be this ballot measure. And I think this particular ballot measure is like the one in Ohio. Last year in Ohio, many grassroots people who really cared about legalization of marijuana drove the opposition to that bill uh, re referendum in Ohio because it was written by industry. It was written by industry for Ohio, and they, they voted against it, and it went down. It went down because local people from the state said, this is not what we want for our state. Um, so this is not the measure. If, you're, if one is interested in legalization of marijuana, I don't think this is the, the, the cow you want to ride. Is that just the horse you ride? Something like that. You want to ride this one, I think. Why? Because it doesn't address potency. It, the industry behind this is immense. It has a lot of venture capital. They're going to need to make their money back. They have to make money. When you invest money, you want to make money. And they make money if you work in this industry, if you work on volume and youth. That is where your money comes from. Because by the time you reach 26, you're not likely to pick up marijuana. 
Okay, so they need a supply chain that goes way back, even though the legislation or ballot measure says 21. It doesn't address the fact that edibles, edibles are now 60 to 70 percent of the Colorado market, and what's driven almost all the ER visits and hospitalizations in Colorado, because it's just not possible to understand how the heck much THC marijuana is going into the edible. And I will be glad to respond to sort of hot new points of the Oh, points of the question. One, because I think that they're weak, but that's just me. Okay. And I'm, and I'm not, I, people who know me, I'm not like, but each, I'm not, whatever. Like, I've been very clear. If you're an adult, grown up, and you want to uh, smoke marijuana, I think that should be a choice that you would have. I would say that. I would think about that. I wouldn't want to get in the way of your life, and your job, and your caring for your family, and for it to consume you, and that's all you think about, because that's what addiction looks like. So that's not where I'm coming from, I'm saying this ballot measure, as crafted, is not look like that. Now, this was not from the quad. I don't know, someone found, I, I didn't take this picture myself either, right? I'd be like, wow, okay. Look, I used to be able to do stuff like this, many of us were able to do stuff like this, like jump from things, and I don't know, go out, they trip, you know, whatever, I'm not gonna get it very personal, but things that look like this when we were growing up, and then as you get older, you tend to, you tend to do them less. And that's sort of our risk-reward behavior changes, our calculus changes for what we're willing to accept. So very cool things come when you do this, right? I mean, you could be an adolescent like uh, the Google founders or Mark Zuckerberg who found very interesting companies because they're willing to take risks and do things out of the box. That, to me, is really very cool. And the creativity comes from this, and we really thrive on this. I love going and being, knowing, knowing my students well. But as a scale, do not want to think about healthcare policy and substance use based on this kind of risk-taking behavior because you can't walk away from it if this person in midair cannot walk away from this. So what's the issues? What are the issues to meet here? It's very reward-seeking and somewhat impulsive. Uh, there's a lot of peer influence. In fact, one of the things I love about Massachusetts state driving laws, it's not about a single teenager being in a car. It's a single teenager with another teenager in a car. Because if you look at the data, that's where the accidents happen. Single teenagers actually do pretty fine. It's when they're with peers that, why don't you just put them a little more, just a little more, you get to triple digits. You know, that's when the danger starts to happen. And the exuberance of like new things is uh, a pretty fun time at lessons, and I think a pretty fun time to get older too. But it's so riveting when you're growing up. And this is my only multimedia part of the talk. Which will not, I will not let it fail. Okay, ready? So this is where your eyeballs are. Let's see here. Eyeballs are here. Oops. You gotta go back. I cannot miss this. My degrees are okay. Eyeballs are here. The back of your head is here. And if you think about how human beings sort of came to be, this is the adolescent part. Uh, your vision is sort of here, but underneath that is breathing, emotion, basic stuff uh, like that you have to live with every day. Uh, 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 a lot of sensation, a lot of uh, reflex behavior. And then up here is sort of like, hmm, why do I do that? I don't know. Let me weigh the cost and the risks of the movement. Let me balance that out. And the way that the human brain is sort of grown, it's sort of developed this way. And that's what happens over the course of about 20 years um, from 4 to 21. I think it's such a remarkable way of thinking about things that we're not at any given point fully developed. We're sort of developing over time up until age 21. And then the, the parts that make decisions, complex decisions about what's good or bad for me or my friends or my family members just isn't happening until you're in your late teens, early 20s. And then even that is sort of quite broad, right? Some people when they're 26, some when they're 17. But in the main, you've got some time to build this stuff. And you know, if you think about why Governments like, you know, younger kids going into the military because, you know, they're pretty good about taking risks that other people wouldn't necessarily want to take. Um, so there are ways of thinking about this that, that are used deliberately and others that aren't. Now this is the part I did not put together, but this, <laughs> this idea that your sort of emotional, reflexive, uh, reward-seeking brain often outweighs your logical, judge judgment, executive function brain for a long time, and for many of my peers, or for myself sometimes, this but it still happens, right? But in total, it doesn't happen day to day. In my day to day, I can get to work. 
if I was always like, hey, that's cool, that's cool, that's neat, whoop, okay, good. And I'm not saying that's what adolescence is like, but it's hard to get out of bed in the morning and go to work every day. Uh, it's not something that the limbic system loves necessarily doing. Any thoughts so far or questions? Please interrupt, uh, shout out, no tomatoes, please. Yeah. Okay, but if you'd like. So what is the brain during this time? During this time, it is sort of saying, I've got about, I've got, at least there are more neuronal connections that are stars in the universe kind of thing. So you can't use them all, or you'd be like, right? Someone learning how to play chess, their brain is like, and a chess master, they're like, right? And that has to come over time through pruning of connections that get strengthened, and through strengthening other connections through insulation. Basically saying, instead of trying to get from here onto here or here, we're gonna make a highway. And these highways get built up, especially during teenage and early 20s. And the advantage of that is that uh, now you have a brain that's pretty well honed for lots of really cool activity. Um, it's able to take on really cool different tasks. It's able to learn quickly. But whatever you're training for then sort of gets set in motion. If you're training for things that require creativity and problem solving and uh, you know helping other people, you know, those are the things that tend to continue. If you're not uh, and you're just not engaged with the world, we've seen this unfortunately. Um, um, you know when you, the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, a lot of uh, kids lost the ability to be cared for well within a government system in Eastern Europe. A lot of kids had tons of neglect, and the longitudinal studies on neglect are really tough, tough to see. So the less stimuli you have, the less ways of thinking in complex ways as you're growing up, that's what you sort of have going in your 20s. And people do remarkable things, and they change throughout their lives, right? I've changed many times during my life, right? But there's a lot of foundation that we want to concentrate on as people are in this age category. So we have a very program reward system. We're still developing, like, do I really want to do that? Do I think that's a good idea? And we're building good stuff. Uh, so, how does this all come together? Basically, we're constructing a brain a lot during the teenage and early 20 years. So you don't want to do things that cause trouble with us, right? That's why we've intentionally not sold cigarettes uh, to 18 year olds. And now most states are trying to actually move up to 21. Because the longer you can delay this use of substances, the less likely you are to use them. So, how does this impact on substance use itself. And so um, this graph is a little bit old, but it tells the same story that most substance use begins in the teens or early 20s, those peaks. And it's just hard. In my practice, this is borne out, but if we're on the data, it's hard to find someone who picks up alcohol when they're 50. So are they out there? They sure are. But it's not just the norm. 90% of smokers start before the age of 24. 90%. So if you're the tobacco industry, like uh, having a bunch of ads in the senior center, that's not going to get you a lot of business, okay, new business, right? Those people are trying to quit, okay, <laughs> because they started when they were 14 or 13 or 19. So policy has, over time, started to build on this because these are the age categories where most people are trying things. Now, that all fits. We talk about experimentation. We talk about reward systems. This is not likely to go away. But just means that public policy has to be smart about public policy. Um, and so this onset, excuse me here, sorry. We talked about beginning at this time. The younger the year of onset, the more likely you are to have problem use. Um, and this is my wife, because I'm her proxy, I want to show a uh, bear, bear tribute here. Uh, you know, addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. Um, is this always the case? No, but this is, this is the rule, and then there are certainly exceptions. Now, when I was growing up, I actually started using alcohol in my young high school years, uh, along with a lot of my friends. And I got lucky, probably. I got lucky, right? It didn't affect me in the way that it affected two of my friends who had been struggling with alcoholism ever since. But you could not pick me out of the hat versus them, right? It is just. You're playing the luck, you're playing cards, you're playing genetics, you're playing some social consequences, you're playing some random chance. Um, and we do that as a society. We allow alcohol as a society, knowing that some people bear the brunt of it not working well for them at all. 
but we, then we have to have checks and balances. And this, to me, this balance measure has no checks, no balances. Um, what, if you were to begin drinking at the age of 15, 40% of people will go on to have some sort of disorder with alcohol. That's why I'm saying I got lucky. Uh, after 21, or at 21, fewer than 1 in 10 have an issue. So you really see this change. And again, there are no cut points. There's no rule for any given person. But we're telling a story here. That story is the same for virtually any substance. This graph makes me very happy. The light blue makes me very, very happy. Both of my, two of my grandparents died from cigarette-related disease. Um, they would have quit, I think, if they could have, but they smoked like cheese the whole, their whole lives. And I could, I, as soon as I smell a cigarette, I can, I'm right back in Pittsburgh. I can, you know, be right in their family, you know? But we've cut the absolute rates of smoking in half in 40 years. No other country has done that. Uh, it wasn't because doctors like me were telling patients to stop. <laughs> That helps, but it actually in a more minimal way. What helped was tax policy. What helped was workplace policy. What helped was the flight attendants sued the industry because flight attendants were told there's a smoking section and a non-smoking section on a plane. And I don't think about you, but if you've been on a plane, I don't know how that happens. Uh, so they did. They sued the industry. They were the first class action lawsuit from a set of employees. And that continued and continued. And now we have a 20% or less smoking episode rate in the US, the lowest it's been since the 1950s. That was a lot of public policy. It took a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work, OK? And people are much healthier and have had added lives and benefit ever since. And for us not to use that lesson with this ballot measure would make me crazy. Um, because what we're seeing here is this growth in marijuana use, even as alcohol and cigarettes are coming down, and the sense of safety around marijuana. So here we have youth now, as you can see, from 1975 to 2013, cigarette use. Thank God for youth going down. It couldn't be happier. Marijuana use, though, for youth, for youth, 12th graders going up gradually here, leveling, and then slightly going up. And other data sort of show this continuing. And it's all about risk. I mean, God bless our adolescents and teens and kids and family members. You know, they respond to senses of risk just like we do. They are hearing the industry out there for marijuana saying, don't worry about it. We'll Fine. This stuff is safer than all that other stuff. Just get started. It's all right. Right? We've heard this, this movie before. Okay? And what tends to happen is that people will respond to those messages in the ether. So, what is marijuana doing in the body? I, yeah, man. Yeah, sorry. What happened in 1995? Yeah. yeah. Let's go back. Thank you for that. Yeah. What, you know, in that, in that range, Here. You know, So I'm going back in my life, right? What was happening in 93, 95? That, uh, I don't have enough. So yeah. I think it's all worth us asking what happened. Was just a distribution change? Uh, why are these are these talking to each other in some ways, cigarettes and marijuana? Maybe, maybe no. Before the early 90s, you had the say no to drugs campaign, and it was all of the, this is your brain on drugs and all of that. It was huge, and that's one of the things wrong with it. Using 
recreationally, we'll say, I'm not even sure what that great word means, but for their enjoyment. Uh, and then what things can translate into an addiction. And those things tend to look like alcohol, uh, marijuana, amphetamine, stimulants, um, marijuana, uh, gosh, cocaine, uh, right? Opioids, opioids for sure, right? And so what I'm always struck by, it's not like people are going out and chewing grass, right? Like my dog, sometimes he goes out, and I don't know why he chews this grass. I don't know why, but there's something there that he likes. There, whatever those, those substances that you just mentioned, all have some analog in the bottom. And that is why they, they contribute to a reward system. You have something in your body that that chemical already matches up. And there are uh, cannabinoid receptors, just as there are opiate receptors, just as there are dopamine receptors for cocaine and so on. And so these substances have an impact, not for magical reasons, but because the body has found that chemical to be useful or something like that chemical. And now that chemical in this form is triggering the same reason. I just find that striking, right? We're not going out, people are not eating dirt. Uh, and again, we are not doing legislation about dirt. <laughs> We're doing it around these sets of substances because the body is looking, not to say looking for it, the body is stimulated by something like that, right? It's stimulated. And that continues here for cannabinoids. This is our, where some of the major receptors are for cannabinoids in the body. They're all over, just like for opioids. Just like, you know, I mean, it's just remarkable. In fact, uh, if we think about antidepressants, serotonin receptors are throughout the gut or throughout the brain. Just remarkable. The body's remarkable, but it's a little bit of a weak link, too, because if something else gets in there that then sort of hijacks that, now you're sort of like, geez, you love it, it love, <laughs> your body loves it, and then that frontal part's key, because now you're going to be like, wait, I don't, I'm not looking for this right now. So this is what the ballot measure is completely absent on. Right? It essentially treats marijuana as like, I don't know, what, uh, a penny, right? Any, every penny is pretty much the same like every other one. Except some are solid copper, some are the same thing. Okay, one good. But they look all right. But marijuana is not like that, right? You get marijuana in the gummy bear, and marijuana that you smoke from the 70s with the Doobie Brothers, and then marijuana that you get in Colorado right now, and marijuana that's always working on their face and really cultivating some like, that's all different stuff. And the regulations, as with this proposal on the ballot, say nothing about it. Just like, it's all whatever. Whatever. It's marijuana, right? Just go with it, right? And that's how the measure is written. What's the problem with that? So the, the, I mentioned THC, this receptor we're talking about. This is the part that people sort of get a buzz on, get a high on from marijuana. Uh, that part, in terms of concentration, has gone up almost 20-fold over the last 40 years or so. So this is not me sitting with my guys, you know, back when I was in college, it was all right. You know, I mean, uh, right? Right? This is not the 60s sort of Grateful Dead kind of stuff. Okay, this is conscious, this is like, like hybrid tomatoes, right? Like killer tomatoes, right? Like people have been working on this for a long time because why have this kind of stuff when you get on this kind of stuff? Right? Cheech and Chong would be like, we are golden, like this is so good, right? But they have all day to think about this. We don't have all day. We've got other things to do with our day, okay? And this, again, is not in the ballot measure. The ballot measure could care less what you know about this one. Uh, what else do we know from uh, what the uh, data tell us? Is that people, again, have been working on this, right? We, you know, people have been working in meth labs. People are not making illicit fentanyl. I mean, I used to teach chemistry. Chemistry can be learned by just about a lot of people, okay, if you're interested in knowledge. And you can take marijuana, you can form all different forms of it, including butane and hash oil, which has created a thousand percent increase in the burning unit at UC Denver. Um, because people are using butane to try to leach off the oil from marijuana, and butane, well, it catches fire. Yes, that is a problem, right? And so all of this, the concentration of THC is now going up about 80%. Okay? Now, someone tell me that if I went in my kid's room and I saw this, I'd be like, you stay up the room or something, right? What is that? I don't know, it's a dust ball? I would have no idea, okay? We are going to have no idea what we're dealing with and what it looks like. Um, this stuff is not saying, I am TUC. It does not have a sign on it. 
Uh, it looks like this. I mean, the capsules, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. Okay, this is what this stuff looks like. This is how it's been formed. The legislation, the, the ballot measure says zero about the form this stuff can take, the concentration it can have, how the heck the state is going to measure. Is the state going to go in and measure the content of TNT that everyone needs to have? Are you kidding me? This is basically creating like an entirely new industry that is, to my mind, unregulatable. Is that a word? I think so. I'm making it a word. Unregulable. Not regulable. Not regulated. Yeah, it's that. It's not that. Because now you have your desktop vaporizer, you've got your spray, you've got your beverage. In fact, beverages are a huge industry in Colorado. THC beverages. You've got your candy and ice cream and your baked goods, right? This is not a joint. We're not talking about question four, joints authorized by Massachusetts citizens, okay? This is the menu that is going to be here starting uh, January 2018 and legislated to be in place as of December 2016. Okay, look, I mean, just take that, please take this in, okay? Because this to me blew me away. And that's just like the start, right? Why stop, why stop with this stuff when you can have something else? Um, now, what are the effects? Well, the effects are the classic stereotypical ones we know about with, uh, with whether it's euphoria, slow reaction time, the munchies, the increased appetite, it affects each person differently, just like alcohol affects each person differently. Um, it can affect memory and coordination. And again, as I mentioned here, I'm not talking about a grown up adult making a decision to use something. I'm talking about public policy that will affect hundreds of thousands of young people in Massachusetts. Can you imagine having a drive high campaign here in Massachusetts for your OUIs? What the heck are the police going to do if they're concerned about you, right? Walk this line. And there's no breathalyzer for marijuana. Okay? Uh, and as Nika helped point out to me, in, Los in Washington, the number of fatal car accidents doubled since the legislation. And not every one of those people get the toxicology test, but one in six people involved had use marijuana. So I'm not out to vilify. You just have to say, look, it's a bad mix between driving and substances. We already have had tremendous progress on alcohol. Uh, for us to go back in time and now have an unregulatable, untestable substance for people to have at scale is too scary. Uh, now, if you said people only use marijuana, they don't. Just like with opioids, if you're overdosing on opioids, it's opioids plus. Okay? So it's marijuana plus alcohol, plus drugs and not alcohol, plus other drugs. Like, it is two thirds of the marijuana found at the time of accidents was plus something else. So people don't, you know, they don't punch a card saying, I'm only going to do marijuana. That's not how really things go when you're making judgment calls like this. <clears throat> and we're seeing uh, sort of this uh, growth now in marijuana, even as alcohol starts to tail off in terms of driving and students report use when driving. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? Everything's okay? Any burning questions? Like that Martin guy, he sounds like he's off the rails. I don't know. So is this okay? I don't know. This is what I like. Uh, this part to me is what? What? We don't have like um, sun going around, you know, earth going around the sun kind of data on marijuana. It's hard to do. It's hard to get someone to test now. And then let's get back together in 30 years. Okay, that is a hard study to do. It's hard to fund a study like that. Here, come back here, we'll talk in 30 years. So we have some data that gives us some sense of things, but it tends to show what you'd expect. The longer duration use, beginning earlier, is likely the most problematic as people get older. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple of these because I have some other really cool slides, but I'm glad to share all of these. Um, I want to show a couple of these. One is that uh, adolescents tend to have these this impairment persist even when they're not using marijuana, okay, up to three to four weeks. So it's not like I'm stopping, I'm going to take a test tomorrow, uh, I'm going to ace it, then I'll go back. Like, that's still on board doing stuff. Uh, and please know, I'm not like a fear-mongering doctor or person. That's not how I operate. I just, we should know this is not, like, this is not leaving the system, leaving the body very quickly in terms of its impact. Um, let me find another one. This one really struck me, and I think this is the one where 
where as a, as a society we have to do our best work, okay? People who, we should maximize every person's opportunity to, to reach the top of their potential. And that's what society, I think, has to offer people, right? People come from all sorts of circumstances. We make tremendous progress. We have a country where people can do remarkable things. You put a little bit of a barrier in front of someone who already has other barriers, that is one straw that breaks their back. Okay? And what I was found from this data is just the difference between whether you're a college graduate in use of marijuana and your employment status in the early 20s correlates a lot with marijuana use. And duration of marijuana, these are days per year of marijuana use. 300, 399. Oh, that time for use, I'm sorry. So not quite days, but time for use. And just see, when you see linear relationships like this, like, you're not looking at cause, but you are looking at some sort of connection or relationship. And I, I would be hard pressed to say there is a relationship here that if we really want every kid to have the opportunity to reach their potential uh, in terms of employment and the kind of job uh, work they want to have or school they want to have, this is just one more uh, piece of friction that they would be facing uh, and be susceptible to. And then for real important stuff, lower relationship quality and lower life satisfaction. That's, you know, these are not trivial things. Okay? This is not like one less line in an eye chart. Okay? This is kind of the big stuff that we, we care about. Okay. So in order to make sure that I don't get in the way of anyone wanting to get home during daylight or go to the debate or anything tonight, um, I want to make sure that I get to the next part. Okay. This is the Steve Martin version. The, the, the ballot is actually called Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Initiative. I've called it the Massachusetts Marijuana Industry Creation Initiative. This is my name for it. Um, and this is not trivial. These are intended consequences on our culture and norms that are put set in motion with this ballot measure. This is a great article looking from Sharon Levy, who runs the addiction clinic at uh, Children's Hospital, an article that she had recently, Lessons from Big Tobacco. What are our lessons from big tobacco? We've got a lot of lessons. In fact, we've lessons not from big tobacco. You know, we have lessons from Colorado. And if I were to listen to one report, if I were to spend less than an hour listening to one report, I would Google on point, WBUR, Colorado six months of legal pot. I remember listening to this in 2014. It blew me away. I listened to it again today. It blew me away. It's the head of the emergency department from UC Denver. It's the uh, marijuana beat reporter for the Denver Post. It is um, it's oh, the sheriff of San Miguel County and the, a member of the Denver Post editorial. And there they are six months after legislation. And you will get a flavor of what they were dealing with. Because they, they had their socks on. They had nothing in the in ready. They were not ready. And mostly, most all of it because of evidence. Okay, so what do we know about this ballot measure? People could have up to 10 ounces at their home and one ounce on them. Thanks to Neeker, I actually know what an ounce is. Like I know other things, but an ounce of marijuana I did not know. An ounce is about 30 to 50 joints. I was like, an ounce? I put an ounce in my coffee and coffee, whatever. I don't know, right? 30 to 50 joints on your, on your person and 10, 10 more at home? I mean, this isn't like uh, you know a day at the park. I don't know. I mean, that's some serious volume. But not only that, you get to grow it with this ballot measure. You get to grow it, and you get six plants per person. But twelve per household. Twelve per household. Um, and that's about thirty-two ounces. You know. So what? That's volume. That's either going to be sold or used or sold or used. I don't know where that goes. Or Mulch. I don't know what happened to that, but that's basically a business, right? And if you have other states in New England, that's export. That means people aren't working. The opportunity cost of this, of your new job being growing pot in your home as a business model, is not one we, that's not our employment model for Massachusetts that we want to cultivate. Um, the American, I mentioned the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, these are just, youth are very main targets of industry. Their business model is built on people younger than 21 beginning this habit. 
Um, and just to mention that 45% of marijuana products in Colorado are food and beverages. This is not, again, a toke uh, from a bong or a joint. Okay, this is, uh, well, I'll show you what it is. We'll, we'll look at some pictures. This is my favorite part of the talk, and then I'll let you go. Okay. So what I did was I looked at vote yes on the question before. What are the things people are saying? Why should you vote for this? I was like, God, they should have hired me. I could come up with better stuff than this. This is, don't hire me. I'm Okay. Uh, okay. Marijuana treatment against a real drug crisis, pain killers. I do a ton of opioid addiction care and a ton of chronic pain care. I have yet to meet a patient who's like, Doc, if I could just smoke a joint, my pain would be all better. This is a joke, okay? And I'm just, it maddens me that that's sort of their, the approach here that's going to solve the opioid crisis. What's the other one? Fear of arrest. Fear of arrest. Are you kidding me? We decriminalized marijuana several years ago. Nobody has gone to prison for marijuana. I worked in federal prison at Devons for two years as a medical officer. The criminal justice system and mass incarceration for minority populations should have us all seething, seething for the, for the drug war convention. But that is not what is happening for marijuana in Massachusetts. And this is another red herring of uh, clogging our legal system for decriminalized marijuana. What? I don't know where they get this stuff. Marijuana is here. No increased police presence is going to change that. It's from their website, I think. It's like a kid wrote this. I don't know, no, no, that's bad on kids. It's like a grown up adult wrote this in some Washington, no, D.C. lobbying firm for this industry, okay? Because what they basically are saying are scare tactics about arrest, misleading about medical use. We already have medical use in Massachusetts. Um, playing on legitimate concerns about racial bias, as I've mentioned. And that number four is going to be safety. We have to regulate this. Regulate if we don't have it. In the lure of tax money, which is just a joke, talk to Colorado about all the money it's got in the schools. Like that. Okay? Yeah, we have other ways to pay tax money. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not going anywhere. Okay, so um, this is the No on Four site. This is a new ad that they put up here. People are like, this is a scare tactic. This is not a scare tactic. This is what's going to happen. Stores everywhere. We already have bait shops. I live near Greenfield. We've got bait shops. What? I mean, what? Really? Do we need more stuff like that? I don't think so. Uh, now, who's told us how to do this marketing? Well, the food industry. They're really good at this, right? Here's the scientific officer for Frito Lay. I feel so sorry for the public. Right? You know, Cheetos were engineered. They've got the right mouthfeel. They're great. They're salty. They're, they're just, they're just perfect, right? That is not by chance. And then we learned the food industry bought off who? They bought off public health. They bought off researchers at Harvard. I mean, you could go on and on about where the, what's going to happen coming down the pipe. We know about this for, for cigarette smoking, right? Hunger Games. Who reads? Oh, that could be me. Smoking in the back of a car. A little more. Okay? This marketing is going to happen over and over again. It happens with alcohol. It's going to happen in Massachusetts with marijuana. But you don't have to have it go because here you have basically things that look like candy. Like, why not make it look like a block of tar or coal or something, right? Because it's not appealing. You have to be appealing for people to want to use it. And so it looks like that, or it looks like this. And I'm, that's really funny. You play on words. I'm, it took like five minutes to make up these names. I don't know who did that. But, you know, cotton candy, really? I mean, this stuff, again, that's what's gonna happen. Uh, this, this, there's just no two ways about it. Edibles are weird. When you smoke marijuana, you reliably, each person gets about 30% absorption, reliably. If I have the same THC, the same marijuana today and tomorrow, and I, Steve Martin, smoke it, I will apply the same effect, okay? Edibles are freaky, freaky, because I, Steve Martin, could eat this edible today and eat the same edible tomorrow and feel something completely different. Completely different. So within the same person, their absorption goes, goes very different and their effect can be monumentally different. And there's no way to know what's in that. This is what Connor always be crazy, right? They took chocolate bars. How many, how many doses of marijuana do you think are in a chocolate bar? One dose, right? I don't know. I, when I get a chocolate bar, like I'm not, like I'll make that chocolate bar, okay? That's gonna happen. 20 units of marijuana in a chocolate bar, right? Now, 
Now I eat one unit. Oh, I don't feel anything. Oh, I better eat another one. Oh, I better eat the whole chocolate bar. I mean, none of that in the in about measure about how the heck to account for all these dosing problems. And then lastly, to uh, to make sure that everybody gets home in time. Um, this is uh, child hospitalizations over marijuana. Again, all edibles, all with edibles. Um, uh, and then, yeah, why would you have Cookie Monster and Girl Scout cookies on your marijuana business? Why would that happen? I don't know. I mean, I just going up on me you track the Cookie Monster and Girl Scout cookies, I'm a little bit different than most people. But you can see where this went. Like, this is going to go to the lowest common denominator, which is the most appealing market, which will be people who will buy a product. If you're 21 years old, you may have to get in here. But some will. And if you're a kid growing up, you will have in your mind, this, this is a kind of normal place to have fun. Okay? Um, the reverse of this is what's going to happen, I think. Even in Northampton, we're seeing this with the dispensary for medical marijuana. These places are going to look high tech. They're going to be like the eye store for marijuana. Okay? It's like the Apple store for marijuana. There's so much venture capital going in this. They've got the other marketing of nobody. They're smart cookies, okay? Let's not pretend it's not smart. They're gonna have the cool paneling, and like the bud vases, and like the headphones. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's gonna look appealing. You're gonna wanna hang out there. This is not like Starbucks, where if I hang out there, I have a coffee, and maybe I get a little, you know, ready to do some more work, <laughs> okay? This is gonna look appealing, and people are gonna be attracted, and the marketing here is just gonna because they have to make money. Um, they have to make money any way you can get it. We're going to have a one buck joint when you're up there on the mountain, right? This is Colorado, right? I just can't imagine this. This is what we're looking at in Massachusetts, right? This is what we're looking at. How about, uh, how about a billboard, right? We spent decades trying to get rid of cigarette advertising and regulating alcohol advertising. Here we go again. Okay, why? Because they have to create a market. Um, so, you know, in addition to the On Point episode, this is the No On 4 website, um, which I think is pretty well put together. Uh, wrong for kids, wrong for Massachusetts, opposed the creation of a billion dollar marijuana industry in Massachusetts. I think there are good talking points here if you're looking for them. The talking points I would use are THC ain't what it used to be, <laughs> edibles, completely unregulated industry, and lack of local Lack of local control. We don't do that for alcohol. My friend owns an alcohol shop. He has to go to the Board of Liquor, Board of Alcohol, to get that license. There are three licenses for that town. That's it. They intentionally took that out. They intentionally wrote that out of the Okay? This has to get far for them to get money. And there's a resource list that we can also share through the QDRAW website and so on. Um, but just that, just that one on point episode, not for scare tactics, but just because I've never heard this in ear dot talk like these. Like we were just totally um, it's not things that are easily done through regulation, right? Edibles are not going to be. There's no switch to turn at the state house in Boston, and now we've perfectly regulated edibles. And once the stuff is in the environment and gets to scale, it's out. The genie's out of the bottle. I mean, we just don't have a way of thinking about that. Because this stuff is relatively easy to grow and then harvest, we're just going to be dealing with the back end of it. So those are my thoughts on this. I, I hope I hope it's giving you a sense of what the data are and what the actual legislation or ballot measure would, would put into place. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I've intentionally not talked about marijuana. I've not talked about a uniform opposition to legalization for yours truly. I've not talked about grown-ups doing something recreationally that they might want to think about doing. But I have talked about public policy at scale in the entire Commonwealth, creating a massive industry that has to make money on the backs of young kids. And I'm not for that. So glad to talk, glad to have any conversation, and hope the presentation was all right for you.
I'm a little struck. Although I, I should say that uh, at the announcement for this organization with Charlie Baker and Marty Walsh. So I feel like I have not. Yes, seen I agree with you. The um, what can I say? The the, the I feel like this to me as a, just as a citizen who tries to stay aware. Yeah. Uh, this issue has been a, like a under the radar issue. Yeah. Under the radar. And part of it is sort of like. Colorado did it, California might do it, Maine's voting on it, who knows? You know, or part of it's maybe the oxygen in the room going to presidential or going to charter schools. But there you're right, there's been very little oxygen in this, uh, to my mind. And uh, the first ad from this group coming out today, I think it's, you know, it's not, there's not a lot of money going into opposition, so it's hard to get funding into word on the streets kind of work. I think the kind of work that we're doing here this grassroots work is pivotal. Uh, Shannon, Levy, Shannon Levy from Children's has been very much out in front of the public, but it's part of it's really people's attention. And I think I think people also are want to be nuanced about it, right? I mean I'm not coming out here, you know, with a firebrand and pitchforks, you know, about marijuana. I'm just saying this is a bad way to vote for this. And that's maybe hard to do in 30 seconds. But I, um, so I, I, it's a great question. I don't know what the lobbying has been like in the marijuana industry. I have to think in you know, Massachusetts, even, I admire the state in general in terms of policy. We really are careful about things. Um, but when you go to a referendum, you know, there's interesting commentary on this one. Columbia, when Columbia put this, the Nobel Peace Prize and the president of Columbia for putting together this peace agreement, 40 years, 50 years of civil war, right? They signed the peace agreement. It's a rainy day in Columbia. And 50.2% of people vote against this peace agreement. That both sides want it. And you know, the reflection on that is that democracy is actually ballot measures can be your, the only worst enemy of democracies. Ballot measures tend to peel off very polarized situations, a relatively small group, and so you have basically 8% of people making a decision for 100% of people. Right. So I think that part of this is just get the measure in there, no signs, just fire up the base, and you'll go that. If you look at the BUR poll, you know, it's very much a demographic shift in terms of age, um, which I can understand, right? You're seeing how attitudes are changing, but policy is different than attitudes changing. Policy means, you know, cookie monitors on buildings or, you know, a, a, a growing youth use to fund an industry. That's hard. No, that's what you're working Yeah, I'll be happy to send it along to you. Yeah. 
No, it's been, um, gosh, uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, it ranges uh, from, uh, you know, kids who are, again, again um, any piece of pressure that gets in their way, in school, uh, it gets into young kids and edibles, as I mentioned, uh, it gets into um, uh, tourists coming in, recreational marijuana tourists coming in, eating those five chocolate bars, and now they're in the ER with sick with vomiting um, and hallucinations. So I think we have to look at that and share that. Yeah, just when you said kids, I don't know what the And that, that is, people are just, that's not, that was hard for me to confuse. I was like, what does that mean? Edible, what does it look like? Uh, no, that's, that's infused gummy bear, right? And I think that part is, is not really, but, uh, um, I, so I remember the day right before they had them, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they were struck, they've been struck uh, mostly on, on the, um, also on the, on the mental health side. Yes. No, I can't even go there, right? I mean, that's the part. I, once you get this genie out of the box, this is a genie. Like this genie will not want to go back in. <laughs> okay. Um, to your point too, I think that I think the fatalities in motor vehicle accidents to me was very striking. Some people. Okay, that is 
that as, old, as a human species, that's not going away. Uh, the thing is, when you, when you deregulate, it's very hard to walk the dog back. And I'll give one personal example. I took care of a, a patient at Devon's. He was about 70. He was an inmate there. He had grown up on a farm in Kentucky, growing tobacco. And I was doing research on what happened when people stopped, were forced to stop smoking in federal prison. And he said, Doc, I just can't, when I was growing up on the farm, 14 and started smoking, okay, that, that stuff is totally different than the stuff you buy in a pack. Okay? That's like down on the farm, Kentucky, beautiful, you know, tobacco, okay? Not enriched for nicotine, not put into a perfect cylinder delivery system. Like, it's a nicotine delivery system, that cigarette. Um, that's what we're looking at here, is a creation of an industry that preys on people's nostalgic rec recollections of high times, and then builds, you know, gummy bears full of 90% THC in them. And that is, that's predictable, okay? That's the Dorito chip, okay? <laughs> okay? This is, this is, people find ways to market things that human beings enjoy. That's okay. Ice cream, like I love ice cream. Okay, I don't want ice cream to be great. Like I only get one scoop. Of, like I hear that, but we're not. The harm here is totally different and not regulated. This is not regulated blood. I think it's my mind in a way that we'd expect alcohol. This would be like going to get, you know, you get a six pack and it's actually ninety percent ninety proof. You can't taste it. Okay, that's what this is like. You just we have no way. We've never done this before, and. Um, and that's the part to me that is deceiving about this battle question. It's not honest about what other states have found, and um, it's 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 uh, it's it's presenting itself as sort of a you know mechanism of free will and liberty, uh, right to do what you want, and an older population that's, that's enjoying some recreational use, sure, but not at scale, never like this. So um, yeah, hi. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. I I just I first of all I love that show, okay. and it's just a great interview. It just is really raw. You just hear where they are, and I would I would say look I don't think Colorado has not solved any problems in 2016, then they didn't have in 2014. Okay, it's not like oh two years later everything's fine. <laughs> um, but there's there's two episodes on on point. One is more current. This is from 2014 directly from. Um, the more the more recent one actually devolves into an argument between a pro and a con group, which you know is even the host is like, what are you guys doing here? Um, but this one from 2014, very raw, right from right from folks uh, uh, who didn't necessarily weren't against things, but when it came into fruition, were like, oh my god, oh my god. Well, thank you very much for all your time. Okay. <laughs>
And luckily, we don't have 10,000 people, so we don't automatically open the door to a dispensary. But unfortunately, there are a lot of. Don't be far away. They are far away, and any town that has already accepted a medicinal dispensary will be backdoored in to accepting a recreational one. If they cannot fulfill all of the requirements that they have to by the 2018 opening of a regulated town dispensary or a store. So if that, all of those rules can't get put into place, which there's no way it will ever get really put into place by 2018, it will go through all of the dispensaries that already are licensed in our towns. And they're not far away. I was just thinking, as you mentioned this regulation last year, before you go, if you're looking, if you're looking up something else, I would look up Ohio's story from last year. Because these were local pot growers, basically, and proponents saying, this is not, this is not the law we want for our state. This is an industry law that basically locks in five companies to get all the business in Ohio. Um, and so in that way, it's not ideology about you know, black and white. It is saying, look, if you want to do this, this is not the way you want to do this. Um, and I thought that was a re remarkable outcome for Ohio to have this uh, uh, unusual assembly of med fellows to say, not in our state, not like this. So if you're not already signed up, please do sign up. And if you want additional information about anything, please come and talk to us. Thanks for being here. Have a good night.